Welcome, everyone. My name is Julian Barnes Dacey. I'm the director of the uh, Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, and really uh, glad that we can have so many of you joining uh, for this conversation, thinking a bit about Iranian foreign policy, both in terms of uh, events in Gaza, uh, the, the wider regional war that we've seen uh, since that date, uh, presidential elections in, in Iran and, 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 and the switch away from the Raisi um, presidency, and obviously kind of setting that to the backdrop of, of, of domestic politics in the US and Europe and, and trying to get a handle on some sense on, on, on where things are going in Iran, what the likely trajectory of their regional and, and wider foreign policies are likely to be in the, in the period ahead and, and, and what kind of questions and dilemmas and answers that leaves particularly for, for Europeans um, in, in the coming period. This conversation is um, a discussion that we're convening on the back of uh, a series of, of, of recent um, uh, written outputs and, and wider products that, that we've done looking at Iran. Um, if you go to our website, uh, you, you'll see some work on Iran and Iraq, Iran's role in the Levant and, and the, the sense of its positioning towards Israel. Um, we had some, some work from last year on, on Iran-Russia relations and uh, domestic politics. So we've been spending a lot of time and effort trying to think about where Iran is going, uh, what that means for the region and, and, and wider Western policy towards um, uh, Tehran. And we thought this would be a good opportunity to, to bring these different elements together in this conversation. This will be an on the record conversation and I'm really delighted um, that we have such a stellar cast of my colleagues uh, to bring their insights to the table. Um, many of them, if not all of them, you will know, but let me just briefly introduce them. From London, we have Ellie Garamaya, who's the deputy director of our, our Middle East program and, and leads our Iran work. Um, in Washington, DC, we have our director of research and, and head of our US program, Jeremy Shapiro. We have Hamza Haddad, um, also in the US, but, but long time Baghdad based, who, who runs a lot of our work on Iraq and just published uh, this paper looking at Iraq Iranian relations. And then finally, from Berlin, we have Hamid Reza Azizi, who is a consultant with us, also a, a, a fellow with SWP in Berlin, um, with whom I had the pleasure of co-authoring a recent paper on Iran's positioning across the Levant and 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 its um it, it, how it views the, the kind of deepening conflict with Iran. So on the back of that, I just very quickly want to open the floor um, to these to 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 the to my colleagues. They're going to offer some some initial reflections on how they see Iranian positions on on a number of the files from from the nuclear file to to the regional file to to relations with the U.S. And then I'm going to go back to them for a second round of questions to think a bit about what this means for for Western and and particularly European positioning towards Tehran and the broader region. How should Europeans be positioning in the year ahead um, in terms of questions of escalation, de-escalation, the nuclear file, um, Iranian involvement with, with Russia and Ukraine and, and so on and so forth. And then I very much hope that, that you um, will want to come in uh, with questions. We have a really distinguished group of, of experts, diplomats, journalists in the call, um, and you're very welcome to, to pose questions. We'll be using the chat function in that. For that for that purpose and please do feel free to, to come in whenever you want pose a question and i'll make sure that is answered so without any further ado um i want to pass the floor straight on to my colleague ellie jeremiah ellie um there's a lot happening domestically in iran at the moment um obviously the the, the reaction to, to the hamas attacks of october 7th and the subsequent war in gaza has, has kind of resonated quite loudly but then we had the, the 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 death of the president and the foreign minister and, and upcoming elections. Um, obviously, there's been a few uh, presidential debates and foreign policy debates that have already unfolded in the recent days between the candidates. Um, what is your sense of, of of the mood within Tehran, the the mood particularly within those that control the levers of power? Um, and what do you think these shifting regional, international, and domestic developments mean for for how um, Iranian power brokers see their place in the region and the world going forward? Thanks, Julian, and good to be with you um, all. I hope my voice uh, carries through. I'm recovering from a cold, so apologies for an intermittent coughing. Um, so as you said, there is another election to follow this year in the year of elections, and this one is a um, surprise one. And I've always said that despite this very um, 
narrow net of power in the Islamic Republic of Iran, the system still has an ability to surprise itself. And there are wild cards that can come into the mix. And right now, the main topic of debate inside Tehran um, is this issue of the five plus one. And they're not referring to the world powers, but they're referring to the candidates for the presidential elections, um, five of them from very conservative hardline backdrops and one uh, random reformist slash moderate candidate that ha has somehow made it through the very uh, strict vetting process. And so unlike the last presidential election is in 2019, uh, which was viewed as very engineered to bring to power um, former uh, President Raisi, um, this is not going to be a mundane election uh, to watch, in my view. And already there has been a debate opened up on foreign policy as being a integral part of Iran's domestic policy in terms of addressing the number one core issue facing the country, which is the economy. And I've been listening to the debates and the roundtables that have happened over the last few days. And I think that the most interesting candidate from a Western government perspective to be watching is um, um, Pezeshkian, the candidate, the Masu Pezeshkian, who has been backed now by more moderate factions and the reformist faction inside Iran. And in a recent debate, he's unveiled his foreign policy vision and agenda. And I think that there are essentially five areas that are going to be quite important um, for Western actors to be watching. And just before I go into those, I'll say that it was really interesting that in um, unveiling his foreign policy agenda, he brought with him two senior advisors, um, which are uh, old guards from the Rouhani administration and cabinet, former foreign minister Zarif and uh, a former ambassador to Russia, Sanai, who both have this vision of Iran needing to have relations with all world powers and not be tied on, on either side. So this is very much what is influencing um, this vision that he set forward. Um, so the five areas that I think are worth watching is one, that he has said that diplomacy is going to be the lead path forward. Um, he's saying that essentially that they're not going to be ideological, it's not going to be a um, administration of slogans, um, as he said that the previous administration was, but that they want um, to use diplomacy to unlock the problems the country's facing. The second thing is that he has, um, uh, unsurprisingly, given he's brought Zarif on, uh, given full support for the nuclear deal and talks with the US in specific. He's mentioned this as being part of the um, key to the country's problems. And he's even uh, supported very controversial financial regulatory frameworks in the international fora that the Europeans have really been pushing Iran um, to adhere to. The third thing that um, his team has mentioned is that Iran needs to rebalance uh, itself amongst the great powers. Um, and I think this is insinuating that Iran under the previous administration had become too reliant on Russia and China uh, without much gain. Um, they have even said they want to negotiate and be in a position of talks with Europe on a more equal footing. So I think that this is going to be a, a big driver for, for their agenda as they look at the region and, and the great powers, even countries like their policy to places like Ukraine going forward. Um, the fourth thing is that this focus on how to mend the economy for them comes back primarily to removing sanctions or at least easing it. Um, and, you know, they have focused in on the fact that under the, in, the two years that the nuclear deal was being fully implemented uh, on, you know, with sanctions being eased, that the economy was doing much better than it was under the Raisi government's three years of this idea of resistance um, towards sanctions. And that their, their premise is that sanctions evasion has created a massive uh, corrupt economy inside Iran um, that basically will not be mended until you start to ease uh, international sanctions. Um, and the fifth thing is that they've uh, insinuated his team that they're going to continue their regional integration. Uh, and I'm going to let Hamid talk more about that. But I think they have dropped certain hints that de-escalation with Israel is going to be part of that policy. But I, I would say that these are hints um, at this time. Now, on the way ahead um, for domestic conditions Iran, I would say that there are two major questions over the next nine to 10 days. 
Um, one is, is there going to be voter participation uh, in favor of Pazeshkian? Because there is still a huge degree I see of voter apathy and disillusionment, particularly after um, uh, the Mahsa Amini protests. There has been a resurgence in recent weeks of the morality police. Um, again, crackdowns have started. And so there is this sense of hopelessness amongst particularly the youth uh, voting generation that uh, traditionally the reformist faction would have uh, relied on to turn up and vote. And in my view, there is certainly a new buzz in this election compared to the last few elections in Iran, including the parliamentary elections, whereby the reformist elites are coming back into the scene and they are encouraging people to vote. Uh, but whether that's going to trickle down to the general electorate is a big question mark for me. And we'll have to see if in the next nine days and traditionally in Iran, the elections are decided in this last week period, whether there's going to be more social cultural figures that come out in support of people voting and if that's enough to persuade um, the, the, the base of the reformists to reignite. And the second major question for me is, does it matter if someone like Pezishkian comes in versus the five other, let's say, conservative hardline candidates? Uh, now, there is a, a big push uh, by the reformist faction in Iran to say, yes, it does matter. Um, even in recent debates, people like Zarif and Pezishkian have said it matters who is the president. It matters because they create foreign policy. They've specifically talked about this. It matters because they persuade the rest of the system on the foreign policy. And importantly, they implement it. And I think this was a sort of hint that under the Raisi administration, despite intentions to negotiate with the US, they really couldn't get a deal done, um, even with a democratic administration that was more open uh, to deal making with Iran. There is another side to this argument that says that if someone of a more conservative IRGC backdrop, for example, like um, the candidate Qalibaf, who's been in the system for a very long time, but like President Biden has stood and failed for elections many, many times, that if this is his lucky year to become president, that actually he would have the backing of the IRGC to get the job done, especially if they are facing a administration in the US like the Trump administration. So we'll have to see what happens in the next couple of um, days. But what I would be, what I am more certain about is that whoever is um, inside um, of the executive branch in Iran between August, November, and possibly January, depending on who wins the US elections, we are going to have a holding pattern because there's going to be a transition period um, in Tehran. Um, surprises can happen, by the way, in both the US and Iran. And I think right now in Iran, obviously, the succession of the supreme leader on, is on everyone's mind, particularly after the sudden um, death of the, the president. Um, but I'll finish by just noting that one very rare silver lining that has emerged from this um, incident inside Iran is that for the first time, the US presidential and the Iranian presidential terms are aligned, more or less. And um, in previous um, um, years of elections, we've essentially lost about a year and a half in transition and election period uh, for the US and Iran to, to start really talking. And I think one positive um, thing to have come out from all this is that actually their presidential calendars are now aligned. And that means that potentially from November, if there's a Biden administration or from January, if there's a, a Trump administration, um, there's going to be almost a four year period where um, the system in Iran and the system in the US can focus on what policy they're going to have towards each other. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Ellie, thank you very much. Let, let me just quickly come back to you with a one minute question. Um, you've, you've, in a sense, uh, talked about the candidate of change and, and where there could be an opening. Um, if Khalibaf or, or one of the hardliners does win, um, as still probably seems more likely than not, um, sh what should one expect then? Is it, you know, is it the same as a continuation of what we've had before? Can we expect a doubling down, an even firmer line on some of the regional nuclear policies? Or do you think there's more of a systemic acknowledgement that actually these economic pressures require some shift in course that could nonetheless create an opening, even if the, the more reformist candidate doesn't win? So I think that Alibov is the more interesting candidate of the conservative hardline factions because he has come out on the record even in recent days to say that he is open 
to negotiating with the US. And he's called it a step by step approach that he'd want to take to ensure that, you know, Iran takes one step on de-escalation and the US takes one important step on US sanctions relief. Um, and again, he's the sort of character that some would say is can get the job done because he has the backing of the IRGC. I'm more skeptical of this viewpoint because this is also what was said, said um, when Raisi came in charge, that he was, you know, the Supreme Leader's man, that he was he had the backing of the IRGC, and yet in the execution of power and in the management of these foreign policy relations, especially with the West, relations have completely plummeted. Um, so I do think it, it is important. Um, Balibov, as I said, is one of the more interesting candidates and poll numbers for what, you know, take it with a massive grain of salt because it's coming out from Iran and polls everywhere are historically difficult to ascertain. But Khalibov is the front runner amongst the conservatives. But then if someone like Jalili, who is the very ideologue amongst them wins, then I think we can expect a much more hardcore, let's resist sanctions, resist them more and resist them some more and pair up with China and Russia, Russia uh, much more categorically is what we're going to see. So I don't think that what we're seeing in the elections in Iran is fair, uh, uh, but it is more competitive this time round than it was in 2019. Great. Thank you very much, Eli. Um, Hamid Reza, let, let me come to you, if I may. Um, obviously, um, the regional dimension of Iran's foreign policy has, has been kind of central to, to, to what's been happening, and, and particularly since October 7th and the Gaza war, um, we, we, we've seen some, some significant escalations, some very dangerous moments in terms of direct Iranian Israeli clashes and strikes. And obviously, right now, as we talk, the, the situation between Lebanon and Israel with the, with Iran's um, Hezbollah support, uh, Iran back Hezbollah movement is, is incredibly tense, and the risk of a, of a wider war is very acute. What's your sense as someone who has spent a lot of time looking at Iranian regional policy and the and the kind of so called axis of resistance of, of how Tehran um, is thinking about these different dynamics at the moment? Um, are we in a situation where one should expect further escalation? What does Tehran want from the current situation? Um, how do you see things? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me on this panel. Uh, so let me start by uh, where actually Ali left on uh, the implications, potential implications for uh, foreign policy. Actually, while, uh, I mean, a few days after Raisi's death, uh, while uh, the funeral uh, was still ongoing, uh, there were efforts by uh, the IRGC and um, basically uh, the core of the system who's been uh, running the uh, original policy uh, since I would say uh, the uh, you know the establishment of the Islamic Republic there were clear efforts to show who is actually in charge and I uh, mentioned uh, um, one uh, very important uh, example on this on the sidelines of uh, Raisi's funeral there was a meeting uh, quite unprecedented in terms of publicity uh, between uh, the uh, commanders of the IRGC, including the chief commander, uh, General Salami, and also Esmail Ghani, the commander of the Woods Force, and uh, the representatives, high-ranking representative of the so-called uh, resistance groups, uh, including, uh, you know, the Palestinian factions, the Houthis, uh, etc. And the message is actually coming out of that basically was uh, that there's going to be no interruption in the way that Iran has been supporting the Axis. And this was echoed also by uh, Khamenei, for example, in the meeting that he had with Bashar al-Assad uh, when he uh, visited Tehran, uh, he basically praised Raisi's um, uh, foreign policy and the way that Amir Abdullahian was uh, kind of acting as a uh, connector between these different resistance groups and uh, a call for continuity. And given that you know, the ideological pillar of Iran's regional policy uh, basically lies in the hands of the supreme leader and the strategic direction, uh, be it the uh, forward defense or uh, the current repositioning vis-a-vis -vis Israel, which is part of that, but in a state of transition, being in the hands of the IRGC. So we are going to expect uh, more of continuity, but being more precise on uh, how Iran sees the uh, current developments and where uh, lie the risks actually 
uh, there's uh, five developments. I mean, if you look at the narrative coming from Tehran, uh, there are at least uh, uh, five elements uh, that are mentioned uh, as the uh, proof, basically, that Iran is having the upper hand uh, in the region. And uh, this has led to something that I could uh, describe as uh, overconfidence on the Iranian side, on the uh, basically victory of uh, the Islamic Republic and the axis of resistance. So the first one is actually the event of October 7 and the Hamas attack um, on Israel. If we look at uh, how Khamenei has uh, basically praised uh, why not uh, taking a responsibility and emphasizing that it was a Palestinian act, the way that he has praised the, the issue and has called it a kind of irreparable blow to Israel, it shows that basically um, one of the main uh, uh, changes that has happened in the Iranian perspective since October 7 is that that image of invulnerability of Israel has, uh, uh, you know, uh, is no longer there. And uh, that is uh, the uh, first achievement uh, by Iran and its axis of resistance as seen in Tehran. The second one, which is quite related, is the challenges in the path to normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel, and more broadly, uh, the Arab-Israeli cooperation or partnership. So again, uh, Khamenei stated a few days before October 7 that those who are normalizing with uh, Israel are uh, betting on the losing horse. And as a result, uh, he and his uh, supporters basically have interpreted that as a, a proof of their uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, that's their argument was um, actually right. Uh, so the way I see it, uh, the Iranian leadership uh, seems to recognize actually that the normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel is a matter of time. It will happen sooner or later uh, at the official level uh, also. But uh, what matters to them is that uh, the developments related to the war in Gaza are very likely to affect the modalities of this normalization. And this is what matters most to them. So what is crucial for Iran is that uh, Saudi Arabia uh, does not enter into a military security partnership with Israel against Iran. Not Saudi Arabia, not uh, the other uh, you know, Gulf countries, actually. Uh, so uh, Tehran believes that uh, its own show of strength in the past few months, and uh, also that of its allies in the axis of resistance since October 7, uh, plus that image of Israel's uh, invulnerability, uh, you know, shrunk, uh, combined with the negative reactions of the Islamic societies, Muslim societies to the war in Gaza, has already uh, ensured this outcome that, uh, you know, the costs of a security co uh, cooperation between Arab states and Israel have, uh, has risen. Have risen. So uh, the third element is uh, improvements in Iran's own relations with uh, with Arab states. Uh, so the war in Gaza actually contributed to that. Uh, you know, since the early weeks, you know, the interactions between Amir Abdullahian and uh, foreign ministers of Arab states, Raisi going to uh, uh, to Riyadh uh, to Saudi Arabia, basically meeting with Mohammed bin Salman, even after his death, unprecedented uh, uh, visits by, for example, foreign ministers of Egypt and, and Bahrain, all these things are interpreted as uh, basically uh, the fact that uh, not only uh, the October 7 and the war in Gaza um, have uh, reduced uh, the chances of a security partnership between Israel and uh, Arab countries, it has also uh, contributed to Iran's uh, so-called uh, neighborhood policy and has opened up uh, opportunities uh, for this. And um, Tehran seems to be uh, quite willing to continue this. Uh, the fourth one is, um, of course, international pressure on Israel, which Iran interprets as Israel being increasingly isolated, um, contributing to uh, its weakness, which again, uh, as I said, uh, basically uh, helps Iran and its allies in the axis of resistance uh, to have the upper hand in the region. And finally, the fifth element is, uh, which is uh, quite significant, and it is maybe the strongest element among these in the Iranian narrative, is uh, Iran's April 13 attack on Israel. Uh, so they believe the attack was successful in restoring deterrence against Israel and demonstrated Iran's power to all regional and extra-regional parties, actually. 
Uh, they uh, obviously downplay Israel's response on April 19, which was, of course, significant in terms of strategic uh, messaging of that, at least. But in any case, the extensive and direct attack on Israel in the Iranian perspective broke a taboo and uh, basically uh, not only, and, and it caused not only Israel, but also other countries in the region to uh, reassess their policies. So these are the main pillars of the narrative uh, that Iran is promoting. So just to conclude, uh, Iran views all these developments as a success of its of, of two policies that, uh, you know, is more or less attributed to the Raisi administration, but overall it is the, it has the endorsement of the Supreme Leader, neighborhood policy or neighborhood diplomacy, so-called, and what they call resistance diplomacy, with Amir Abdullahian being the, the, uh, the main man behind that, you know, this kind of um, diplomatic support for the axis of resistance, uh, adding to uh, th what Iran was already, uh, uh, you know, supplying to these groups in terms of military support, etc., and economic support. Uh, so, in the Iranian view, all these factors combined have provided the basis for the emergence of a new regional order, in which Iran and its allies are treated equally by external powers. Their role as uh, uh, their their role is recognized by, uh, you know regional and extra-regional powers, Israel is isolated. And uh, basically the role of the US as uh, the dominant power, the hegemonic power uh, is uh, decreased. So I can go into the details later on, but uh, this was just the uh, overall uh, picture I wanted to uh, depict in terms of how the arena narrative is uh, at the moment uh, regarding developments in the region. Thank you. Hamid, thank you very much. That was a very kind of rich take on, on that kind of strategic understanding of, of, of the situation. Um, let me turn now to, to Hamza Haddad. Um, Hamza, who's based in a, in a Baghdad and who has done a lot of work for, for us on Iraq, given obviously the kind of longstanding um, Western focus on, on Iraq, but also a sense that obviously kind of what happens in Iraq is obviously um, for a long time, uh, being susceptible to external dynamics, the relationship between Iran and the U.S., and that's played out quite aggressively and contentiously in in um, inside Iraq. But it's also, of course, been the center of a Baghdad process that, that kind of unleashed new dialogue between regional actors such as um, Saudi Arabia and Iran. So we're quite um, focused on that, and uh, and there is a sense, I think, in Europe that that Iraq is a country where. Um, there needs to be a focus on protecting its stability as regional volatility increases. So it'd be great to get your sense on how um, Iran's influence and role has evolved since um, October 7th and, and, and the, the kind of domestic Iraqi response towards that. Thank you, Julian. And uh, excellent remarks from my colleagues, Ali and Hamid Rada. I'll first begin by saying... <clears throat> It's important to remember that the underlying cause of this conflict is the lack of a Palestinian state and the ongoing occupation of Palestinian territory by Israel. This was not caused by Iran, which was in fact an ally of Israel in 1967. But today we find ourselves in a world in which Iran plays a big role in this conflict and primarily through its partners and proxies. The fact that Iran is a supporter of Palestinian rights only empowers Iran the longer Palestinians are suffering, and Iran is being vocal in its support, the more legitimacy Iran gets in the region. One of the things we've been trying to do at ECFR is to clarify and, and nuance the relationship between Iran and various neighbors, in particular Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria, given the interconnectedness of the region that you just mentioned and the growing fears of spillover of this conflict. In Iraq's case, it has had a, cons a consistent stance on the Palestinian cause, whether it was under the British-imposed monarchy, the Republican era under the Arab nationalists, and later the Baathists, or today a democratically elected coalition government, Iraq's position on Palestine has been constant and does not need Iranian influence to push for it. Therefore, it's important not to conflate political alignment between Iraq and Iran with undue Iranian influence. To understand the dynamics of Iraq today, for those who do not follow it closely, Iraq is, only, is not only a multi-ethnic state, but a religiously diverse one that has been holding competitive elections since 2005. These elections have produced coalition governments each and every single time because no group has come close to winning 50% plus one. And so there's a diverse set of actors and opinions in Iraq. Some political parties and leaders are closer to Iran than others, but generally they all have a working relationship with Iran. And that includes the Kurdish parties in the semi-autonomous Kurdistan region of Iraq. I want to emphasize this because there's a misconception that Kurds present uh, a front line of anti-Iranianism backed by the West. 
Um, but these are long-standing political and economic relationships between Iraqi Kurdistan and Iran, including the fact that over half of Iranian exports to Iraq enter through Iraqi Kurdistan. And just last week, Iran's acting foreign minister spent two of his three days in Kurdistan when visiting Iraq. The relationship is deeper and more complicated than many would have you believe, and it's understandable considering Iraq shares its largest border with Iran. Iraq has, has and will continue to have a strong relationship with Iran. But what does that mean for Iraq's stability amidst the tensions after October 7, especially as Iran is seen to be the key supporter of Hamas? I mean, we can discuss this at length in the Q&A, but for now, I want to mention a factor that frequently gets missed in analysis. The fact that Iraq is very important to Iran in accessing the global market while Iran is under Western sanctions. Ali mentioned how important uh, the economy is in the Iranian elections at the moment, and that's what's leading the debate. Um, and so there's not only a fear for Iranians of being dragged into a regional war, as others on this panel can tell you better than me, but Iran has been distancing itself from the, uh, from, from the actions of Hamas and also are afraid that Iraq gets dragged into the fray and Iran will lose one of its most vital economic partners. That is why when Iraq's prime minister pushed certain armed groups to halt their attacks on U.S. presence um, after the killing of three American servicemen in Tower 22 on the Jordanian, Syrian, and Iraqi border, even Iran's IRGC general, Smail Qa'ani, also reinforced that message. And so there's also the question of stability in Iraq and juggling multiple armed groups. But what needs to be emphasized is that none of these groups are like Hezbollah in Lebanon. None can challenge the state. The largest of the groups, which is the Southernist movement, tried to do so in August 2022 and failed immediately. And so because there are many small paramilitaries and they helped the state survive the ISIS onslaught a decade ago, there was this belief that they could overpower the Iraqi state militarily. That is not only the case, but it also goes against how many of these groups see themselves as part of the Iraqi state. They want to uphold the Iraqi state and be more integrated in it. Those that do not share these ambitions are what pose a threat, but they're not at the level of what Hezbollah is in Lebanon and never will be. Iraq is not like Lebanon, despite the shared consociationalism. Um, the social contract in Iraq is different and does not, and at the end of the day, Iraq does not share a border with Israel or have a history with Israeli occupation. What Iraq has done since October 7th is participate in all the summits uh, and meetings pushing for a ceasefire and advocating for a Palestinian state. Even at venues like COP28 in Dubai, the Iraqi president, Abdel Latif Rashid, was pushing the message of a ceasefire and Palestinian statehood. Next year, Baghdad will host the Arab League summit for only the second time since 2003, and it's clear that the Palestine issue will be key. Um, hosting the Arab League and various other meetings is a key indicator of Iraq's stability and its role in the region. Iraq has adopted a soft power approach through mediation and dialogue, which not many foresaw for, for the one's belligerent state, but this stability was hard earned and will not be given up easily. And I think this is where Europeans can work best with. Hamid, are you finished there? I wasn't sure if you had completed there, but thank you very much, Hamid. Um, sorry, Hamza, for, for, for those interesting thoughts on, on Iraq. And, and yeah, I think there's a lot that we'll come back to, um, and particularly kind of unpacking the, 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 the kind of last bit in terms of what and how Europeans should, should adapt to that situation. Uh, Jeremy, um, coming to you next, sitting in DC, um, as in a sense, all of our speakers have, have already referenced the kind of the relationship, the dynamic between Tehran and, and DC is obviously so central uh, to so much of what's going on, to the to the nature of, of Iranian uh, foreign policy, regional policy. So it'd be great to, to get your sense on, on how you see uh, the current administration thinking about the Iranian um, issue. Obviously, um, you, you've you had um, uh, a non-re-entry into the nuclear deal. You've had um, U.S. strikes on Iranian assets in response to Iranian strike back strikes on, on, on U.S. bases in the region over recent months. Um, how do you see that? How do you think they're thinking about it? But, but then obviously also there's an, a small election coming up, um, which, which may have some um, implications for, for where things head next. And, and you and colleagues just wrote a very interesting paper for ECS Bar yesterday, laying out some of the potential scenarios of a, a new Trump presidency, including in the Middle East. So it'd be great to, to kind of get your sense looking forward a bit as well, um, how you think Iran will play into US positioning and, and, and kind of what Europeans should be um, considering as, as, as they bear these elections in mind. 
Thanks, Julian, and thanks for having me. It's good to be here, um, and it's good to see all the colleagues. It's, uh, now that I'm back in the U.S., I don't get to see people as much, so it's nice to see your faces. Um, look, uh, you mentioned that there is a small election coming up here that has been in the news, and I think it is um, quite a focus of every kind of policy, but particularly Iran policy, which is uh, which in come in the given the sort of nexus between Iran and Israel is one of the few foreign policy issues that really enters into the election at all. Although I wouldn't say it's paramount, but it's it it it, it matters to some degree. Um, and I would say you know to sort of summarize the Biden administration's policy toward Iran, uh, at least between now and the election, it's avoid a wider war, um, and. Uh, what interestingly we we heard from um, from Hamza and I think from Hamid too that that's also kind of the Iranian approach, um, and so they the Biden administration does believe that it has a sort of a tacit understanding reinforced by very strong um, deterrence, including the deployment of a couple of aircraft carriers into the Mediterranean, and a <clears throat> strong response to the attack in Jordan that killed three. U.S. service uh, people that um, that they have established a sort of uh, you know temporary modus vivendi with uh, the Iranians, and I'm, they in in fact claim to have various sort of contacts with them that express that. They take for interest interestingly a very different view than the IRGC narrative that that Hamid noted about the imp the impact of the Iranian attacks on. Um, on Israel in, in April, they, from their perspective, um, the Iranians were surprised at how poorly the, the, those attacks did, how little, how few missiles got through, and may, maybe even more surprised at the degree of cooperation and integration uh, between the US, Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia in, in dealing with those attacks. Um, so uh, they believe that they have a, a sort of strong uh, understanding and deterrent in place uh, to do that. And what they really want to do between now and the election is avoid that wider war and avoid a sort of stronger nuclear breakout, which is a, a, a more public nuclear breakout from Iran, which is obviously would be a causes belli uh, given traditional U.S. policies. Um, and that um, that gets into some interesting U.S. European dynamics. I think that we saw at the IEA, I guess it was last week. Um, one of the things that the U.S. wanted to do is not is not push the Iranians too hard on the nuclear file at at the IEA. They didn't uh, contradict the European view that the Iranians were violating various elements of their uh, nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, um, responsibilities, but uh, they didn't feel like pushing that at the IAE at the moment would have been helpful and was actually more likely to lead the Iranians to further uh, further down the nuclear path. And so they tried to get the, uh, particularly the French and the British to not do that, which is a sort of interesting turnaround. Uh, the French and the British uh, pushed it. And of course, the US was able to modify it a little bit, but in the end, had to vote for it because there was no way that they were going to oppose it. The Russians and the Chinese um, did. So it really uh, didn't serve much purpose. And I'm not sure that this is that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things, but I think it shows what the U.S. is trying to do, the the, the, the tightrope that U.S. is trying to walk with Iran between now and the election. Uh, the administration and, and why they don't exactly have even their European allies on board, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, the um, uh, I think that, you know, after the election, it becomes a lot more interesting. Um, obviously, uh, the one of the signal, the signature uh, failures or at least uh, lack of successes of the first Biden administration was the failure to get back to an Iran deal or at least some sort of facsimile thereof, which creates more of a, a more of a permanent modus vivendi with with Iran in the region so that U.S. attention can turn elsewhere. Um, there is every intention to get back to that. If you listen to Ellie's lay down of what a, a reformist administration would do, it accords perfectly with their understanding of what Iran's interests in this are. 
and why they might be willing to get back to such a thing. It's quite extraordinary in my mind, and I think Julian, this will make you laugh, but um, that they're that they're still talking about this. Um, but uh, but they are, and I think that there there is going to be uh, there, uh, at least an effort to return to diplomacy on this front in in a new Biden administration. Um, certainly not before the election, I don't think. I'm sure. Um, whether it will succeed, I think is is much more difficult to predict, but um, the, there is a divide within the US, the Biden administration right now on the lessons of that failure in the first term. And, and there's quite a few people who believe that they should have just sort of pulled the trigger on returning to a roughly the deal that they had before in the Obama administration, not tried to sort of improve it, not tried to please Republicans uh, who are unpleasable on this file. Um, and instead just sort of bit the bullet, taken the negative publicity and moved forward. Um, and, uh, and that the lesson is that they should do that the next time. There's another faction that doesn't want to do that. And actually nobody knows which faction the president in, he is in. He was, he was definitely in the first faction uh, in the first term, but that's because he believed he could work with the Senate and with the Republicans uh, on Iran. And um, it's hard to believe that that view has survived uh, the last four years, but I guess we will see. The Trump administration is obviously different, but maybe I'll, uh, and uh, we've outlined one possible scenario for that uh, in, the, in the paper that Elsa put in the chat. Um, there, uh, it's quite unpredictable, frankly, and interestingly, Robert O'Brien, uh, Trump's former national security advisor, released a paper released a paper in foreign affairs the other day that had the sort of re, re a very different scenario reimposition of of maximum pressure which i think is also frankly a possibility uh so we can i think maybe we want to discuss that a little bit in the discussion and uh, uh but uh i think i can summarize by saying anyone who says they understand what trump and the trump administration's policy toward iran it will be is is lying, and that includes if that person's name is Donald Trump. Jeremy, thank you for that note of certainty from, from Washington to plan around. We can make clear and um, uh, rational decisions. Then um, I wanted to come back to you all for a quick second fire round, um, just to think about what you think this should mean for for European positioning, European policy, and in, in the days and weeks and months ahead. Um, there are a whole number of issues. I'll let you choose which ones you you, you want to respond to, but but maybe if you could just give me two or three minutes uh, before we open up the Q and A to 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 put out some kind of European policy ideas. Ellie, why don't I start with you again, please? Well, sure, I'll. Uh go on the topic of the nuclear deal, which is Jeremy's favourite topic to talk to me about. But um, in October 2025, uh, the nuclear deal is going to terminate, essentially, at the UN Security Council level. And what that means is that at the Security Council level, the Iran nuclear file is going to be officially closed. Now, in my view, the main area where Europeans can have an influence, they certainly have an interest and they have a stake in trying to resolve between now and October, is to find a way forward. Um, and I think that as soon as the US election results are clarified for them, uh, they need to get busy with planning some sort of a, at least loose arrangement that will come into force after October, 2025, which may form the basis of initial set of negotiations between the US and Iran through European intermediaries. We know they've done this before uh, it's quite successfully. And my word of warning for Europeans is not to be more Trumpian than Trump when it comes to Iran. Um, let the US and Israel do the coercive angle um, of this file, and they should stick with their traditional job of trying to find a diplomatic solution um, to, to avert a bigger crisis. Thanks. Eli, thank you very much. Hamid, um, how can Europeans help prevent uh, regional escalation and war now? Uh, sure. So uh, just briefly, I mean, the risks, uh, I mean, the first thing uh, we should do is to understand the risks. Uh, so what I described actually gives Iran some overconfidence, as I said, and that might lead actually to actions that could uh, spark a larger conflict uh, in the region. And we shouldn't forget that uh, after April, uh, the threshold for conflict, uh, actually direct conflict between Israel, Iran and Israel has 
already passed and uh, direct confrontation is more likely. So the stakes are higher than before. And add to that, uh, the potential uncoordinated acts by uh, Iran's partners uh, and uh, proxies in the region that might uh, jeopardize uh, also uh, Iran's improving relations with Arab countries, for example. You know, we have heard uh, Houthis still uh, threatening uh, uh, Arab states. So what I'm going to say is that uh, while everybody is focused on uh, the uh, Israel's northern borders and the potential uh, war with Hezbollah, it can be actually much bigger than that, uh, especially uh, given this overconfidence and given that Iran feels having the upper hand if Hezbollah is uh, going to be involved in a war that would mean uh, sort of, if Iran basically feels that uh, Hezbollah's ca capabilities is uh, decreasing as a result of a substantial Israel attack, then th that might be a point when uh, Iran, uh, you know, will decide to intervene uh, directly. So for Iran, Hezbollah is totally different than, uh, uh, than uh, the other uh, parties. So uh, three quick things. Uh, first, uh, priority should be, I know this is uh, not new, but uh, the priority should still be on ending the war in Gaza. Uh, the second thing, uh, uh, Europe should, uh, of course, uh, you know, double down on its efforts and join US efforts to mediate between Israel and Hezbollah, because uh, that's where, as I said, uh, the main risk lies. And uh, finally, one of the entry points actually is uh, to uh, support uh, improving relations between Arab states and Iran and actually try to build on those relationships and uh, use the Arab channels, which is now more than just Oman, uh, to uh, find to, to convince Iran uh, to uh, some sort of modus vivendi uh, in the region. Hamid, thank you very much. Hamza, um, there's a European focus on preserving stability in Iraq. Um, what would be your message on that front? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd echo what uh, Ali and Hamid Rida said. And when it comes to, to Iraq, just to remind Europeans that to continue with, to work with the Iraqi government as an ally, um, not to give up on Iraq because they're inundated by poor analysis grouping Iraq with Iran all the time. Um, and just because Iraq has a strong sense on Palestine, not to forget that it is one of the rare democratizing states in the region. Um, and so that makes it a natural ally. Just last week, it sent its foreign minister to Ukraine uh, peace summit in Switzerland and signed the final declaration, which the likes of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain did not. Um, at the end of the day, these are autocratic states who will drop Western allies when it is convenient to them. Um, they have no incentives to promote democratic values. Um, and again, like as it's already been mentioned, uh, Europeans shouldn't make the same mistake as Americans basing their bilateral relations in the Middle East dependent on that state's relationship with Israel or Iran. Each state is independent and a unique entity. Um, and it's time for nuance analysis um, and basing that on that. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it's difficult to give policy recommendations for what is a peripheral issue. No policy Europeans can adopt in Iraq will resolve the Palestinian issue. That needs to come from a broader vision. Um, as for relations Europeans want to have with Iran, Iraq can only help achieve more cordial relations. It will not participate in sanctioning or punishing, or punishing its neighbor as it once did in the 1980s. What Iraq will do is uh, have, have things that decrease Iranian uh, influence in, in Iraq. For example, like the Total deal, where it helps Iraq capture its own gas to stop buying from Iranian gas but that should not be misunderstood as becoming aggressively anti-Iranian. Thank you. Hamza, thank you very much. Um, Jeremy, finally, let me come back to you and in, in your six scary scenarios paper that, that you put out yesterday or the day before, you said that Europeans need to prepare um, for, for the uncertainty and risks that, that come with the Trump administration. So what would be your specific message on Iran and the Middle East in, in, in terms of how to prepare? Obviously, um, you know, colleagues here have talked about the need to, to action something on the nuclear deal, still try and keep that, that issue che uh, checked in, prevent regional escalation. Um, is, are those goals that you think our Europeans should be pursuing and, and how would you advise them to, to go about that in light of where US politics could be headed? Easy questions. And you're muted. Sorry. I, uh, I was told that the questions would be a little bit easier. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I'll, I'll give a shot at that. 
Um, it's hard to prepare for the Trump administration, of course, because we have we have don't have a great idea of what it will be. We know how the Republican Party sees Iran, but we don't really know how uh, Trump does. I mean, if you look at Robert O'Brien's uh, foreign affairs piece that I mentioned, it it somehow doesn't even mention the 2019 Aramco uh, attack and the lack of response by the Trump administration to that attack, which is kind of the signal uh, event in the in the U.S. Uh, role in the region in that in that time period. Um, so uh, so I think that, you know, we don't know. I mean, obviously, unity is always a sine qua non and very important. I would emphasize one other aspect which hasn't really come up. And I, it's not surprising because, you know, it's 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 a sort of extra regional consideration. But uh, yesterday, I guess, you know, Vladimir Putin was in North Korea and he signed a sort of some sort of non-aggression pact with the North Koreans. From a U.S. perspective, the this sort of broadening of whatever you call the axis of upheaval or the axis of something from uh, a regional thing centered on Iran to a global thing centered on Russia and China is a is a very disastrous development um, and seems to be proceeding more from the Ukraine war than from the Gaza war, but they both are pushing in that direction. Um, and uh, I think a big focus of uh, a Trump administration will be on separating Russia from Iran. It will be a focus of the Biden, Biden administration too, but I think an even greater one. Uh, and that means that, you know, they could of course, do that in one of two ways. I would predict that a Biden administration would do that by being a little bit nicer to Iran and a little bit meaner to Russia. Um, but a Trump administration may well do the opposite, which is to be uh, nicer to uh, Russia and meaner to Iran. Um, and I think that Europeans should be preparing for the idea that uh, that U.S. policy with, toward Iran will be now seen in a much more global lens uh, wrapped much more around Russia and even China, and that they should be thinking about their prioritization in that regard. And which one, <laughs> given that one, uh, to to make foreign policy is to choose which of these things they prefer. Jeremy, thank you for that. Um, so we now have about ten minutes for questions, and I would ask you to to use the chat function or to send them to me directly. Um, I won't be bringing in, in speakers. Um, I have a couple already that have come to me directly. Ellie, um, if you could um, possibly reflect a bit on picking up what Jeremy was just talking about, um, the the kind of evolving positioning of uh, Russia and China on the nuclear issue and, um, you know, whether they can be a partner with the West in addressing that, whether there is more of a competitive element that means that, that the Russians and the Chinese um, will make it much harder to, to, to box that issue in again. Um, yeah, so I do think Russia and China are necessarily playing the same role when it comes to this issue. Um, there can be a more cooperative uh, position from China in trying to ease U.S. sanctions um, because there are benefits to be gained from entering the Iranian market for the Chinese uh, free of U.S. sanctions. Uh, Russia is a much more complicated case because they are actively benefiting from Iran under sanctions in terms of uh, joining forces for sanction circumvention uh, with Iran on a number of different files. They are very much in a trial and error uh, succeed and fail, one step forward, one step back uh, uh, position at the moment. But uh, Iran is a very good guinea pig uh, for Moscow to see what's working, what's not. And so it's not necessarily in Moscow's in, uh, interest right now to see Iran relieved from the sanctions uh, shackles. Moreover, obviously, if the US tries to lure Iran uh, with the prospects of sanctions relief, obviously, I think it will ask for uh, Iran to put a break on its um, military partnerships with Russia, especially when it comes to Ukraine. And so, again, it is not in the Kremlin's intention. So in my view, and I think uh, people in charge in Iran are very clear eyed about this, that Russia is not going to play the same role that it did in the lead up to the 2015 uh, deal where it was a, a partner in trying to make that deal work. And my sense has been for a long time that any future arrangement 
will have to be that, will have to be an arrangement between the US and Iran involving Europe, uh, potentially involving Arab countries, um, and that that old formula of the JCPOA of world powers and Iran is not necessarily going to work going forward because of the state of play um, after Ukraine. Thank you very much. Hamid, I, I've had a question come in to me asking a bit about um, Iran's rapprochement with its Arab neighbors. And you talked about the kind of calculus in terms of preventing a, a security, um, a counter Iranian security alignment. What, what the question asks kind of what kind of things Iran would be willing uh, to do, what kind of compromises it might be willing to make, if any at all, with Arab partners uh, to take forward some of these regional partnerships. Is 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 Iran in the business of being constructive as, as Arab states would view it? Um, or, or, or does Iran effectively feel that it's in a strong position here and it can dominate terms to its its Arab uh, neighbors? Uh, it's somehow a mix of both uh, because, uh, you know, back again, back to the narrative, uh, what has been uh, the dominant uh, uh, kind of uh, slogan, I would say, uh, in the um, uh, narrative of the supreme leader of the IRGC, especially, and also reflected in uh, the way that Raisi was conducting foreign policy, was to uh, conduct diplomacy from a position of power. And uh, that was the way, uh, I mean, again, if you look at uh, uh, what uh, the, uh, you know, uh, state affiliated uh, experts, for example, say, uh, or uh, what is reflected in the media, uh, they mention uh, the acts of the Houthis, for example, as uh, one of the main drivers for Saudi Arabia to come to terms uh, with Iran. So that issue of basically Iran uh, seeing itself as uh, having the upper hand and being in a position of power, also uh, uh, does play a role here. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, there has been uh, some steps that uh, Iran has been trying to uh, take, I think, uh, in order to uh, preserve this, uh, this atmosphere and this, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, ongoing rapprochement with uh, Arab states. For example, uh, for the first, and this was actually surprising to me for the first time in, in years, you know, despite, uh, all the escalation in the region and the increasing conflict uh, with uh, the United States, with Israel, there have been almost no talk of Iran, you know, uh, targeting U.S. interests in uh, the, uh, uh, you know, Gulf countries. Uh, so that is uh, one of the uh, main uh, uh, elements here. On the other hand, uh, of course, uh, we are not going to, we shouldn't actually uh, downplay the uh, internal and local considerations in the Houthi decision to uh, kind of uh, re, uh, to sort of shift its uh, stance uh, from confronting Saudi Arabia to Israel. Uh, but uh, Iran's approach is also important there. So this shift in the uh, Houthi uh, uh, targeting from, again, from uh, Saudi Arabia to Israel, United States, sort of, that is also reflective of uh, uh, the Iranian approach, I think. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, uh, how I see. It. This is that. That's why I think it is still. Uh, I mean, this whole uh, thing called as rapprochement. It is more uh, something like a, a de-escalation still, and it takes time until uh, we enter into a, an actual uh, a rapprochement of, of some sort. Thank you very much. Hamza, a, a question to you about Iran's influence over um, Iraqi security forces and, and, and someone saying that, that basically doesn't Tehran have full control there? They're the ones that reigned in the militias recently. Um, one can talk about kind of uh, Iraqi independence or autonomy, but ultimately Iran and so on, calling the security shots. Um, wh what's your sense on Iranian influence on the ground in terms of the security actors that have proved so destabilizing to the country over recent years? Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, when when things are unstable, that's when Iran has more influence. So again, this example that that I mentioned and being brought up in the question, uh, the de-escalation started by the Iraqi prime minister, the commander in chief, um, and it came the the IRGC uh, came in support of it because it came it was targeted towards a specific group that's less integrated in the Iraqi state. Um, I always I always uh, bring this up that. These groups became prominent and a reality uh, when the Iraqi state was weak and didn't have the support from the West. Um, when ISIS invaded, it wasn't the United States that was the first to support it based on a SOFA agreement signed in 2008. It was the Iranians that came in and helped. So that's something to keep in mind um, when assessing 
the, the the level of influence. But the more the more stability there is in the region, the more stability there is in Iraq, the less influence Iran naturally has. Um, and I, but I also wanted to add one thing to Hamidullah's point about um, the Iranian foreign policy, and this is from the Iraqi perspective. Um, you see a lot of Iranian experts talk about, you know, how influential is the president? Um, how much does he impact the foreign policy? But from Iraq's perspective, where they were holding mediation talks between Saudi and Iran, um, the final result came after the EC government came into power. Um, despite um, a government, despite the Iranian government in the past being more closer to the West or friendlier to the West, let's say, it was only till Raisi's presidency came, a more Arabist approach to foreign policy, did we start seeing the relationships actually improve? Did we actually see results come from Baghdad's mediation? And so it's a question of, is that because Raisi was implementing Khamenei's uh, foreign policy or did he bring it in? I mean, the Iranian experts will know this better, but for those looking from the outside or working with, with Iran, they did see a big difference with the Raisi presidency when it comes to foreign policy, especially in the regional terms. And I think a lot of the Arab states will keep an eye on the new administration, whether they'll whether they'll maintain that or how that will change. Hamza, thank you very much. Um, we've had lots of questions. I'm afraid I can't get to all of them, but I want to pose one last one to Jeremy and then end pretty much on time. Jeremy, someone asking um, what the sense in D.C. is about the risk of an Israeli um, a deeper incursion into Lebanon and, and, and kind of how the, the U.S. would respond to a potential Israeli Hezbollah war and the risk of a, of a wider escalation that draws in the Iranians? Well, uh, there's a lot of worry about that. <laughs> there, there, that's the nightmare scenario. There is an argument going on as to whether Iran or Israel is the bigger problem in that regard. Um, and at different times, both of them have uh, seemed, um, uh, let's say, less wary of escalation and that other times both of them have pulled back. Um, and so it, it, obviously, as we've discussed here, there's these very complicated domestic dynamics in Iran on that question. There's actually also quite complicated uh, domestic dynamics on that question in Israel. As of now, um, the, the assessment is that this is not something that Israel wants uh, and that, that they are also pulling back uh, from this brink. Um, I think that there is there, there is quite a bit of worry that um, that various domestic developments in Israel could push in that direction. And so the the Biden administration is involved in a deterrent campaign against that outcome as well. It's, it looks very different than putting aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean to deter the Iranians, but it is um, nonetheless uh, something that's very much on their minds. Jeremy, thank you for that. And obviously, that's a, a situation we'll all be following quite closely. Um, it's um, 4 or 5 where I'm sitting, so, so slightly over time. Um, I want to keep this to an hour. I know that people have busy schedules, and, and we appreciate that you've been with us for an hour. Um, we put a lot on the table. There are a whole um, series of, of kind of further unpackings that need to be done. These issues are obviously very complex and very dangerous. Um, I'm very grateful for my colleagues for having made the time to, to share their thinking. I think it's been a really rich conversation. Um, I would really um, recommend that the, the listeners pick up some of our recent publications authored by my colleagues. And again, there, there's a lot more richness and, and, and kind of policy thinking and analysis there that I think you'll find very useful. This is a, a, an area of focus that we're continuing to do a lot of work on. We're, we're very focused on dynamics that, that are related directly to what's happening in Gaza between Israel and Palestine. We're looking at the regional dynamics and means to, to prevent wider escalation. Um, we continue to be very focused on the nuclear issue and the evolution of Iranian domestic politics and what that means for, for Iranians' broader positioning, including in terms of its relations with, with Russia and in the likes of Ukraine and so on and so forth. So please stay with us as we continue to, to, to work on these issues. We hope that, that you will join us. Uh, for, for future conversations that we can engage in you with you in, in useful ways. But thank you for joining us. And um, I, I, I mostly thank my colleagues and I wish you very good afternoons or mornings, wherever you are. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.